Um, I wanted to um, follow on Ray's remarks by saying that the website for the October 6th event is um, october2011.org. So the word October is spelled out, I think, I'm, I'm right about that, and then the numerals 2011.org. Many people in Maine have asked, what are the logistics of this? Are we spending the night in Freedom Plaza? Where are we going to eat? All those questions will be answered on that website. I know that primarily they're uh, planning to hold um, teach-ins and educational and general assembly type meetings in the mornings, that there will be training for direct action that will take place in the afternoon should people uh, opt to take place in that, to participate in the action and that they are making provisions for bathroom facilities and food and so forth. I don't believe that the uh, core organizers are planning on spending the night. There's, I, I know that Code Pink has a housing board up, and I know that um, many people are working on how to accommodate thousands of people flooding into Washington, D.C. And I know that many people can't go to Washington, D.C. for various logistical reasons, and I think and I hope that we'll see a lot of solidarity action springing up um, in our own uh, states so that we can support that effort. Well, I'm going to tell a couple stories here about activism, and I hope to illustrate some of the basic precepts that I think make activism effective. And I'm going to start out by explaining why my husband, Mark Roman, and I organized with Mary Beth Sullivan, who we heard from this morning, and Bruce Gagnon at this point on the Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign. Um, a few years back, probably about five or six years ago, I saw a video of Bruce giving a speech standing in front of the gates of Bath Ironworks, and he was speaking about conversion. And he um, alluded to the study out of UMass Amherst. So it, actually, it couldn't have been later than 2007, because I think that's when that study was first published, the uh, Robert Pollan and Heidi Garrett Peltier study about the effects of military spending on job generation versus investment in other sectors. It seemed like a really interesting study to me. I had not read it. And a local um, organizer that Mark and I had been working with, a man by the name of Pete C. Royce, a mill worker in Maine, had been learning how to be a videographer, had been learning how to have a, a stage, um, program on the local access TV that we're all entitled to use. And he was doing, I think he would be the first to admit, a pretty amateurish job at that point of developing those skills in himself. But because he had recorded Bruce's speech and then shared it in a way that I got to see, I called Pete and said, Pete, can you put me in touch with the person that was in that video because I'd like to ask them about that report. So Pete did, and I got in touch with Bruce, and um, we you know, began um, going to meetings together, organizing together, and so all those details aren't important of where we went from there. The important part to me of that story is linked to another story I've heard Bruce tell since, and that is that when he was a young uh, man in the Air Force, stationed out in California, having grown up in a very conservative, military-oriented family, being a young Republican, a true believer as he self-describes, there were protesters standing outside the gate of his base um, with messages objecting to the U.S. military war on Vietnam. And Bruce has told us that that sparked a lot of debate among the, the active duty military people inside the base and that they would sit around in bowl sessions and argue with each other about whether the war was just and, and, and so forth. And so Bruce tells that story to uh, activists so that they'll know you maybe don't ever know what effect you have on people by standing there with just a handful with your signs, uh, being mocked and ridiculed, being ignored by the mainstream media. You really don't know who you're reaching and you don't know how long those effects might roll forward. So I think that we can all uh, remember that when we're standing out in the freezing cold or the boiling hot weather on a bridge or a street corner or in Freedom Plaza and I'm um, wondering, is this really doing any good? Am I just a nut job, like Robert Jensen um, said journalists tend to call us? 
Um, the other thing that I really think that this shows is that Pete's risk taking in um, learning new media skills and learning to do a communications job um, is the type of risk taking that I think that we all need to engage in. Um, most of us here at this conference are of the generation that did not grow up with the internet or the personal computer or Twitter or Facebook or any of that. But um, many of us have tried to learn those skills and the young people in Code Pink have been huge for me in teaching me in a very gentle and loving way, what is Twitter? How do you use it? And why would you use it? What is the purpose? A lot of people use it to fool around. But if it weren't for Twitter, um, the, uh, many of the um, mass movements of people that are happening right now, um, wouldn't, they, they wouldn't have happened because they weren't able to communicate with each other. Um, blogging is another example of a communication medium that I have been mentored by people um, in Code Pink, by Bruce encouraging me to blog, and by reading organizing notes, his blog, and realizing I've learned a lot from that. I get a lot of ideas from that. I've seen videos I would never see if he hadn't shared them. So I too have become a blogger. I blog at went to the bridge, to being um, the numeral two on Blogspot, and um, many people have told me how valuable that is to them and how much they perhaps are considering becoming bloggers. Or if not, saying, hmm, I shared that because my friend wanted to know about you know, what you were writing about. So I want to um, also mention that I had to overcome some of the same um, a cultural uh, conditioning that both Helena and Ray alluded to. Um, my Irish grandmother, uh, told me lots of sayings that have stayed with me. She was my main grandmother. I had a California grandmother also. And uh, one of the sayings that, that she used to uh, share with us was, fools' names and fools' faces are often seen in public places. Wow. Raise your hand if your grandmother or some elder in your family also taught you that one. Okay, it might be a New England thing. I'm not exactly sure. but And the other one was, and this would be a female one, pretty is as pretty does. Okay, raise your hand if you were told that as, okay, that one's a lot more widespread. I had to overcome both of those internalized beliefs to, to um, act with Code Pink. Because I had been doing activist work before that, but until I put on a candy, like a, I have a wig that kind of looks like cotton candy, bright pink cotton candy, and put on the pink and really got out there with it, I didn't realize the communication value of a brand, a color scheme, a short slogan that people instantly identify with. They might hate it, they might love it, they might be neutral, but they get what the message is. And again, being from Maine, where things are often dull, um, New Englanders are, have a lot of virtues, but being flamboyant and flashy is not usually in their uh, vocabulary. It's very easy to get mainstream media attention from very conservative newspapers or television stations if you show up in this pink regalia because it's visually interesting. And the reporter is just looking for a story that their editor will not cut. And Robert Jensen also spoke very well to the point of get your talking point down to three sentences and then repeat it and stay on message because that's what journalists need from you in order to carry your message forward. You know, some of those things weren't as hard for me to learn because I had a background in journalism. I had worked in advertising, public relations. So this brings me to the point about a skill set. We all have different skills. I, if I had to um, build spiral staircases for a living, I would have starved to death a long time ago. I'm a word person. But uh, my wonderful husband is very, very skilled in visual spatial problem solving, and he does tons of things to support piecework or to create things that we use that I would be very hard pressed to come up with. And it's not to say that he isn't a great editorial writer and so forth, but when I see people, they often say to me, oh, you can do that, but I could never do that. And I think, you know, I try to say to them, but everybody has, we all have our areas of strength. And we should be stretching ourselves too, but there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm just not very good at that part. 
but here's what I am good at. My good friend, Rich Lee Fuller, who's the Greater Boston Code Pink coordinator, was on the U.S. boat um, with Ray, does t lots and lots of great work, goes over to Gaza and the West Bank repeatedly as a social worker with her social worker skills, uh, working with children that are traumatized there. Um, Ridgely can talk to anybody. If you stand in the grocery store line with Ridgely, by the time you have checked out, she has made a new friend, probably gotten their email address, and probably made some start at finding out where they're coming from and letting them know what she's working on. She hates the internet. She would be the first person to tell you she is so technophobic. She does have a Facebook page for Code Pink Greater Boston. She does do email, but she very often will ask me, Lisa, could you just you know, help me out with this? I only have five minutes. It would take me five hours, and I'd probably give up in frustration at the end of it. And I'm happy to do that for her. And people have helped me with technological skills that I don't have and many other things. So, you know, honoring ourselves and realizing the beautiful uh, person that we are in the world is um, one of the really important parts of the work, I think. All right, going on to communication strategies. Um, the chief communication strategy to keep in mind, I think, is that communication is not about putting out a message. Communication is about the target audience receiving the intended message. And the only way to tell if that happened is to listen to the audience. First, listen to them to find out where are they? What are they concerned about? What are they thinking about, worrying about right now? You know, if I had to sum up in one word what the American public is worried about right now, it's jobs. So starting from uh, listening to someone telling you about their fear that their son who graduated with college debt in the six figures will never find a real job. And listening to that person, deeply listening. Not only the words they say, but their body language, their facial expression, the tone of their voice. And then when we're ready to put out a message, stopping and checking with the audience, did they hear me? What did you hear? I know what I think I said, but what do you think I said? And really using feedback to continually improve the way in which we are putting out the message that we, um, we want to share with people. I think that um, here I would like to touch base with the law of unforeseen consequences. Um, I'm lucky to be friends with lots of artists in my local community, and um, a couple of them are uh, devoted to, if they have a religion, it's probably the religion of unintended consequences. And I bring this up in this regard because very often in activism, we have an idea, and another person has a different idea, and we have to compromise. And we wonder whether we should abandon our idea because we're so convinced that it's going to be so effective. But so many times in my life, either in activism or at work or in my family, when I have you know, given, given in and said, okay, I'm not particularly invested in that idea, but I can see that you are, so I'm willing to support you in it. Holy moly, who knew? It would be the greatest idea ever. And lots of good things and powerful consequences flowed from it that I couldn't foresee. And I don't mean to suggest that we compromise our principles and our integrity. I think Bunny Greenhouse did a great job of communicating why that's not a good idea. But tactics and, you know, what's our next action going to be? Again, I think listening to other people and feeling that, gee, this person, I respect their integrity and they have a lot of passion around this idea. Maybe I'll go with it and I'll, and I'll see um, where that takes me. Finding out what people need. Again, I know that you've all studied Gene Sharp, nonviolent methods. You've seen it in action with groups like Hamas or the, um, the demonstrator, the occupiers of Tahrir Square. Meet people's basic needs. If you go to Freedom Plaza, it won't be long before you'll be thinking, my basic need is where am I going to you know, go to the bathroom? Meeting people's basic needs is a powerful way of communicating with them. We're, I'm on your side. We're not on opposite sides. I'm there with you. I recognize that um, what you need, even if I don't think I need that, if, if you think you need that, you know, I need to um, make room for that. And that really helps us build relationships with people. And it helps us build trust. And when we have a lot of trust, 
We can go forward in the work. We can act a little bit independently sometimes with the faith that our group will back us up. And if I had to say the one strength of the coalition in Maine that has been waging the Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign together, um, I think that that would be our central strength is that we're operating in good faith and we back each other up. And if someone uh, decides to go in a direction that we maybe didn't have a committee meeting to approve it, um, or we maybe that isn't exactly the direction we would have thought to go in, we've backed each other up and we have wasted very little energy on infighting and struggling for control. And, um, and it's really been a, a, a wonderful experience to, to do that. I'd like to tell another story about fear. I'm a public uh, school teacher. I've been working on public education about 20 years now. And um, the last time Social Security was on the chopping block, remember when W was going to privatize Social Security and the outcry was huge? Um, a person who works in my, who worked in my building as an ed tech, um, said to me in the hall, oh Lisa, I liked your letter to the editor. Because I'd written a letter to the editor saying, do you realize that if you cut Social Security, how many families depend on that? If a, if a wage earner dies, the other parent uses that money to raise the children and, you know, older people that have worked all their lives and can no longer work, you know, you're, you're pulling the rug out from under them. Well, this person said, thank you so much for writing that letter. I was that uh, child. My father died when I was young, and if it had not been for his Social Security, my mother would not have been able to feed and house us. So thank you for saying that. So I said, gee, uh, you know, I'll make up a name, Julie, uh, that's a really good story. People need to hear that. Why don't you write a letter to the editor? And she drew back as if I had suggested that she run naked through the halls of the school. Really, that? And she said, oh, no, no, no. I don't think that Dr. Miller, I'm using a, uh, a pseudonym here too, would appreciate that. And she was referring to our superintendent at the time. And I said, well, Julie, he's never said anything to me about letter, writing letters to the editor. I, I don't think he would object to you, you know, exercising your First Amendment rights as a citizen. And she said, oh, but that's you. Now, public education is a class hierarchical, you know, organization like, like many in this society. And I was a teacher, and she was an ed tech, and maybe that was partly what was feeding into her saying that. However, I had a much more recent experience that shocked me much more than um, that one, and it was similar. This summer, I was at the um, state-level technology conference for educators, and um, I was in a group a cohort with other literacy people and librarians and English teachers, because I'm a literacy coach right now. And um, all of them were around my age, most all of them were around my age, some were a little bit younger, um, you know, secure in their jobs, been in the field for a while, and I was looking for a ride to Rockland because a fellow um, organizer had um, called an action to stand with the Washington, D.C. Al Jazeera bureau chief who had been invited to speak at a fundraiser at a museum in Rockland, Maine. And a lot of hateful, Islamophobic, nasty, um, vituperative uh, press and letters to the editor and hate radio talk shows and so forth had poured forth and they had said that they were going to picket this event. The Islamophobes were going to. So the, the peace and justice community was going to come out and stand with these people. Well, I wanted to try to get a ride at the end of the conference so that my husband wouldn't have to kind of drive way out of his way to pick me up and then I would meet him there. And I figured there must be people coming from Rockland at this conference. There are hundreds of uh, main educators there. And the teacher who was in charge of my cohort knew I was looking for a ride to Rockland. So at one point during a break, she said, oh, I forgot, Lisa's looking for a ride to Rockland if anybody can help her. And then somebody said, you know, what do you need a ride for? So I said like maybe three sentences, trying to boil it down to why I was going to stand against Islamophobia in Rockland. And every one of the about 23 people in the room with me looked like this. They froze like deer in the headlights. They were afraid. They were fearful. And I mean, these are people that probably would describe themselves as liberal, tolerant, economic.
economically secure, and they certainly were educated. People probably, most of them, had graduate degrees and were living in, you know, middle-class splendor their whole lives. Why did they look so afraid? I was never able to explore that with them. Um, it would have been inappropriate to have that discussion right then. But it really showed me how frightened the American people are of rocking this boat, of rocking the boat of exceptionalism and privilege, of the unspoken pact that they think that they have with the powers that be. As long as they don't make any waves, as long as they don't raise their voice, their family will be safe and secure, and that, and that everything will be all right. I am, originally had a history degree and have taught history at times in my life. I mean, I can't tell you how much this reminds me of the good Germans uh, during the rise of Nazism. And um, it's been very, very frightening to live in a society that's moving in that direction. But I think as activists, we can't overlook that factor because, again, I'm, I'm listening to those people that I would think would say, great, I'd love to come to Rockland and stand against um, you know, religious intolerance. Isn't that what America was supposed to be about, we thought, in our idealistic view? Um, right. So I have five minutes left, and I'm going to ask Shalel to help me. He, I'd like to show you a, the website of the main Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign, and uh, invite you, if you want more information about this particular um, successful campaign to, to visit our website. Um, we often recommend that you read the meeting minutes. I know that sounds really, really boring, but you would really um, see, get some insight into the process and the evolution of this campaign that has drawn, um, it's actually the other one first, that has drawn um, a, a lot of uh, activists from different um, parts of Maine together. The Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign didn't start out as that. It started out as people realizing that Obama was going to escalate in Afghanistan, not withdraw from it. And we started having some meetings around that. And many of us were part of groups like Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, like Veterans for Peace, like Code Pink, whose mission statement is basically stop spending on the military, redirect those funds to human needs. Um, but as we began working together and trying to find um, a way of communicating outside the choir, um, someone, not me, I would love to take credit for it, but um, the person who penned the phrase, bring our war dollars home, remains anonymous. And uh, someone came up with that phrase, and I, uh, having the communication background, immediately realized, wow, that is a great way to state that point of view, because they're very short words. I mean, even a six-year-old could read those words and probably understand most of what the phrase was about. And um, we began using that um, slogan and holding events such as the one that you see here in this photograph. This was a, um, this was a reprise a year later of our opening event was um, in our state capitol, in the rotunda of our state capitol building in Augusta. And we brought together people representing different parts of society that were being harmed by budget cuts. And so we had a, a physician, we had a social worker, we had a minister, and uh, somebody spoke to education and so forth. And bringing these people to testify about the effect of out of control military spending on our state. Um, we have continued working with um, many different groups, but one of the most fruitful collaborations has been with the Union of Maine Visual Artists. Uh, there are many vets for peace in Maine, and Rob Shetterly being one of them, uh, Bunny uh, Greenhouse is going to have her portrait in Rob Shetterly's Americans Who Tell the Truth series. He's from Maine, and so um, they offered, it wasn't just Rob, but several others, Natasha Mayers, Kenny Cole said, how about if we did a draw-a-thon? And we brought artists together to say, what could that money have been spent on? And so we've done a series now of events in different venues, different parts of the state around that idea, and it has also helped us uh, reach beyond the choir. Um, the, it's interactive with the public, so the public can come by and say, gee, I would have wanted free airplane rides for everybody, or, or what, and the artists um, render that for you. It's led to um, some 
poster designs that we've now made into t-shirts and so forth. Artists are good communicators, visual artists, that's what they're all about. So uh, that kind of collaboration has really worked a lot for us. Then I'd like to say that because I was already involved with Code Pink, and uh, both Medea Benjamin and Jody Evans as co-founders said, wow, we love your campaign in Maine. Can we steal this idea too? And we said, steal away. So now at this point, it has become a national uh, scope campaign being vigorously waged in California, Texas, Arizona, um, Maryland, and um, other places through the Code Pink network. And so Code Pink has also part of their fairly extensive website um, that has tools that were used for the mayor's resolution. Um, they have been used for town council resolutions, which was another original action in Maine that was uh, pretty effective. It doesn't matter whether the resolutions pass. It's getting the conversation um, going in a public forum. And also, the mainstream media generally covers something like a town council meeting or a school board meeting, or a county commissioner's meeting. And so that's been a real good vehicle. And um, we heard enough about the mayor's, um, I'm still not seeing the code. Oh, he's so good. So um, if we scroll down a little bit, oh, there you see the cotton candy pink wig. Brings a smile to many faces. A lot of people who would be angry if I was standing with an anti-war message when they see the code pink, I mean the silly pink wig, they just crack up because, you know, look like a clown for peace. And if you scroll down a little bit, um, this is uh, Mayor Kitty Piercy of Eugene, Oregon. She was the lead mayor for the resolution. She was on Amy Goodman talking about it after it passed. You might have heard that. But this wonderful pink purse with the um, logo that another very creative young woman, Dana Baliki, designed when she worked for Code Pink, um, also has a toolkit in it. It has videos. It has downloadable uh, flyers and it has the text of the resolution in a way that you could edit it for your location. So I'm um, just showing you that these repositories of tools, David Swanson has said that once I give him a digitized version of the War Dollars Home activity that we played yesterday, he'll put it on his website. David also has been an influential blogger for me. Every time I go and read his blog, I think, wow, if I could be as good of a blogger and get as much information out there connecting uh, different uh, groups and such, you know, that would really be a great thing. I think I'm going to end, oh yeah. Many of the stops on our 30-day caravan that we're doing right now in Maine are at college campuses. The first one is at Unity College, will be at UMaine Farmington, will be at Bowdoin College, um, another college too that I've forgotten now, U oh, UMaine Augusta. Um, one of the challenges of organizing with students is they're transient. They move, they change, they have to, you know, they have to go abroad. Um, but I am very interested in that group because they're the ones that are going to carry the work forward. And what I notice is when they come into a group, if you just let them talk first and nobody says when they finish talking, oh, we already tried that 20 years ago, it didn't work. I think those are very important key points for uh, working with that group. I had the very good fortune to be able to meet with Gene Sharp about a year ago. And um, I had just read his studies of successful and unsuccessful nonviolent methods. And I asked him, you know, what do you think? Give us some advice for the movement. And he said, you guys need a big strategy. I don't really see that you have the big umbrella overall strategy in place. So you're kind of doing this tactic here and that tactic there. And many people that I've repeated that to since have said, yep, that's exactly right. Part of the thing is this is a big country. Um, we need to work where we are and um, come up with things that work in our own community. But I do think that redirecting funding from the military to human needs may in fact be that big strategy. And so I'm going to leave you with some Gene Sharp type questions. David Swanson handed this to me. Um, earlier today. I don't think he generated these questions. I think one of the other organizers did. And I can tell that whoever did this has been studying their, you know, doing their, their research on nonviolent methods. 
So some themes that we might possibly discuss here during the audience Q&A and, and um, participation portion of this panel, I'm just going to read them off now. Where is the military industrial complex vulnerable? This is classic Gene Sharp. Look for the weak underbelly. Where is that point? What are the hidden strengths of the progressive movement? How will moral energy be generated and harnessed? How do you prepare the ground for change? I think Jonathan spoke to us very eloquently about this earlier today. I really appreciated that his talk. What strategies for change are inefficient or unproductive? What strategies will capture the imagination of others and empower them? Again, I think Jonathan spoke to us quite a bit about empowering uh, leadership outside the organization we're in. And then, are progressives willing to pay the price? I'm not exactly sure what the price is. I don't know if the author of that uh, can maybe elaborate on that a little bit during the Q&A. And I just want to thank you very much for your attention.